Sandor Elix Katz is a self-taught fermentation experimentalist who wrote the book Wild Fermentation in order to share the fermentation wisdom he has learned and demystify home fermentation. So I understand that you're a fermentation revivalist. Speak about why we need this revival. Um, well, I mean, basically, uh, you know, most everyone in most every part of the world eats fermented foods every day. Um, you know, they're 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 central to our uh, you know agricultural processes, to our uh, you know uh, cultural practices, to our senses of uh, cultural identity, really. Um, but like all aspects of food production, they have largely disappeared behind factory doors. Um, so whereas, you know, up until about 75 years ago, fermentation was just part of uh, um, uh, you know, what was practiced in every household and every community, um, uh, people have really lost touch with it. And at the same time, uh, uh, we have developed a, uh, a huge cultural fear of bacteria, what I call the war on bacteria, and the indoctrination that we all receive that bacteria are dangerous, uh, that our lives would somehow be better if we could eradicate all bacteria. But as a result of this, people have developed the idea uh, in, in very short time that uh, you know, fermentation is a potentially dangerous uh, um, a process that is best left to experts and uh, allowed to happen um, in laboratories and factories. So I'm just interested in, uh, you know, as, as part of a broader project of reclaiming food in helping to, you know, empower people to reclaim uh, these important practices that give us, you know, beer, wine, bread, cheese, salami, uh, all the condiments we love to eat. Um, and uh, you know, really, are very important to uh, you know how people have historically preserved food before the advent of refrigeration. So, are probiotics a big part of uh, what one receives in eating fermented foods? Sure. Uh, not every fermented food contains probiotics. Uh, uh, for the most part, those are the bacterially fermented foods that are not cooked after their fermentation. Um, so some examples of uh, probiotic traditional fermented foods would be uh, yogurt, kefir, uh, and cheeses. Um, uh, sauerkraut, kimchi, um, uh, kombucha, uh, kvass, uh, mabi, uh, tepache, and a vast array of lightly fermented beverages that people around the world enjoy. Um, so yeah, I mean these these uh, you know foods, particularly those with lactic acid bacteria, uh, you know intact, not destroyed by heat, uh, absolutely are probiotic and um, you know stimulate us in many ways, enabling us to digest our food better, assimilate more nutrients from our food, um, but they also contribute to our immune functioning and our ability just to stay healthy and be resilient. So it, it's understood now that uh, we have many brains, but we might have a brain in, in our head and a brain in our heart and a, a brain in our tummy. So I would see you as taking care of the brain, stimulating by your work, the brain in our tummy, the brain in the gut, which is really important. Um, yeah, absolutely. The, 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 the brain in the gut uh, is, uh, is, is very uh, well stimulated by the, by the foods with live cultures. But there really is an interconnection between all of these brains. And uh, you know, just this year, some re new research has uh, uh, you know, begin to, begun to reveal that um, uh, you know, the chemistry in our, the brain in our head uh, is actually regulated by the bacteria in our gut. So the, you know, the, the release of serotonin 
and other uh, brain chemicals, you know, actually is mediated by bacteria in the gut. So, I mean, we're really just beginning to, uh, you know, understand how absolutely essential to every aspect of our physiological functioning uh, the bacteria in our gut are, uh, you know, and yet they're under constant assault, you know, in this war on bacteria our bodies are a battlefield and so you know antibiotic drugs um, uh, you know antibacterial cleansing products um, chlorine in the water the accumulation of antibiotic chemicals in the water uh, you know we you know the, the the microorganisms in our intestines are under constant assault and so it's become much more important for us in the 21st century than it's ever been for people in the past to really consciously replenish and diversify uh, the gut bacteria. And one way people do it is with little capsules. Uh, you know, the, those are the ones marketed as probiotics. But mm -hmm. you know, really a much, a much more effective way of doing it is by incorporating a diversity of uh, foods with live bacterial cultures uh, into our diets and eating these regularly, and they just happen to be, um, you know, some of the you know most delicious foods that are the you know highest achievements of culinary traditions all around the world. I just have to know how, what what was your portal into becoming a fermentation fermentationist? Well, I, basically. Um, uh, 20 years ago, I moved from New York City to rural Tennessee, and I started keeping a garden. And I was such a naive city kid that it didn't even occur to me that all of the cabbage would be ready at the same time. So when I was faced with that reality, uh, you know, that, that a lot of cabbage is ready at the same time, a lot of radishes are ready at the same time, um, I decided to investigate how to make sauerkraut. And I learned how to make sauerkraut from a book. Uh, and then I started playing with uh, making yogurt and some simple cheese making. Then I started making uh, country wines, uh, meaning wines out of you know elderberries, blackberries, and you know other kinds of fruits that uh, were abundant at particular moments of the year. Uh, and then I just started getting obsessed and um, you know finding uh, finding what uh, literature I could and uh, experimenting and trying every kind of ferment uh, I could learn about. Do you have a Hungarian ancestry? Um, actually, I have, a, I have a Hungarian name, uh, yes. Sandor. In Hungarian, yes. they would say Sándor. Um, but uh, uh, actually, my family is from Lithuania. Um, and that name has been in the Lithuanian branch of my family for, uh, for some generations. Yes, because more sauerkraut in those regions. <laughs> but really, I mean, you know, sauerkraut and sauerkraut-like foods are important certainly all across the Eurasian landmass uh, and yes. particularly in the northern parts of it um, and in many other places and it's just uh, you know it's, it's really a survival practice in places with uh, limited growing seasons to be able to you know preserve vegetables with vitamin C and other uh, essential nutrients um, uh, to feed people in the uh, seasons of relative scarcity and uh, you know many fermentation practices you know really amount to survival practices and in our historical bubble of refrigeration it's easy to lose sight of that and think of these as just uh, kind of culinary novelties but um, you know I don't really have confidence that uh, universal refrigeration will always be within our grasp um, so, uh, so I mean, I really think of this as, uh, you know, we have, you know, along with, uh, you know, the seeds that we have uh, received from, uh, from our ancestors, we have received, you know, all of this cultural legacy of, you know, information about how to use the products of agriculture. And this is, you know, essential information which we can't afford to lose. Speak about your books published by Chelsea Green. Um, uh, I have written uh, three books that have been published by Chelsea Green. Uh, the first one was Wild Fermentation, uh, which was published in 2003, and, uh, and that was my first uh, um, overview of fermentation, how to ferment food at home, why it's important. Um, uh, that led me into lots of teaching about fermentation and traveling pretty widely. and. Uh, 
and actually I did about a five month cross country sauerkraut road show. And I was struck as I was talking to people about fermentation that so many of the people interested in learning about fermentation were actually involved in, uh, in grassroots projects trying to reclaim food. So, you know, I was meeting people who were starting um, communi community supported agriculture projects. I was meeting people who were uh, um, beginning farmers markets in their towns and cities. Uh, I was meeting people who were trying to revi revive the, the art of seed saving. I was meeting people who were part of the raw milk underground and were trying to you know uh, learn traditional methods of working with milk and preserving it. Uh, I was meeting dumpster divers who were you know trying to recycle wasted food resources. And fermentation was relevant to all of these people, but uh, you know it really made me feel very inspired. Uh, all these different forms of grassroots activism to reclaim food. So my second book for Chelsea Green was called The Revolution Will Not Be Microwaved Inside America's Underground Food Movements. Uh, and this is basically a, an, an overview of uh, a grassroots food activism uh, uh, that I saw. Um, and also an exploration of some of the you know uh, issues that this activism was responding to, some of the some of the problems with our sort of you know centralized system of food mass production. Um, and my third book, uh, my most recent book, just published uh, uh, this year in 2012, uh, is called *The Art of Fermentation*. Um, and it is a much more in-depth book about fermentation, a book about fermentation that it would not have been possible for me to write in 2003. Uh, the opportunity to um, you know teach hundreds of workshops and talk to thousands of people has uh, you know I've heard stories you know so many people have stories about what their grandparents fermentation practices were uh, you know what ferments uh, that existed in the old country that they came uh, to this country from that they told me about um, I've met lots of other experimentalists like myself who have tried lots of things and I've um, um, you know, learned from their experiences as well as my own. Uh, and then also I've fielded uh, thousands of troubleshooting questions uh, in person and through my website, which is wildfermentation.com. So, um, you know, it's forced me to do a lot of research and read the scientific literature in order to be able to, to uh, answer people's questions. So The Art of Fermentation, my newest book, uh, is about four times as long as, as uh, Wild Fermentation and just much more um, uh, comprehensive. Very good. Is there something you'd like to say in closing? Um, yeah, sure. I mean, if I if I were to sort of you know distill the message that I've been trying to spread, uh, you know, sort of beyond the joys of making sauerkraut in your own kitchen, it's that we really have to um, abandon this misguided idea that bacteria are our enemies. Um, you know, bacteria are our ancestors, and uh, you know, really, the biological imperative is to coexist with them. And the fermentation arts really are human cultural manifestations of this uh, biological imperative. Beautiful, yes. So transformation, not exclusion. Yes. Yes. Thank you very much, Sandor. Thank you, it's my pleasure.